Hey, welcome to our prophetic ministry class through Immersion Discipleship School. This is session four called Growing in the Prophetic. Now, just a quick review of the last couple sessions. In session one, we talked about the prophetic church where I defined and described the gift of prophet, the gift of prophecy, and the prophetic anointing, which basically is saying that all of the church can prophesy because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but I wanted to make sure we understood that there are gifts of prophet and prophecy in the midst of us having the anointing where all can prophesy. And that led into our session two, which is on the prophetic gifts. And we walked through the different revelatory gifts that dovetail into the prophetic gift, like words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discerning of spirits, which leads into the gift of prophecy. And then last week, I wanted to take another step in looking at visions and interpretation because often one of the main reasons why people miss it when they prophesy over somebody is that they misinterpret what God is saying because seldom is God's voice an actual voice. A lot of times God gives us visions. And so when we looked at the prophetic gift or even the prophetic anointing, we talked about seeing. We feel, we hear, and we see. And we need to understand the visions that we get because many of them are symbolic. And so we talked about interpretation. And what I want to do today is I want to look at what it looks like and what it, how it is that we grow in the prophetic, whether that's your prophetic gift, your prophetic office, or really just the anointing to prophesy. That's what we're talking about. We want to prophesy and we want to do so in the strength of 1 Corinthians 14, 3, which says it's for strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. That realm of prophecy brings about great benefit for the body of Christ. And so we want to build this gift up understand it better and release it in the body of Christ and really in the world and see God do what only God can do as we steward what he's given to us. And so we wanna look at what it takes to grow in the prophetic because you just don't arrive automatically knowing what to do and how to do it. And there's a way that we can grow. There's a way we can partner with the Holy Spirit to share what God puts in our heart for other people. Again, prophecy is to hear what God is saying or to see what God is showing and to say those things to people for their benefit according to scripture. And so we wanna look at this and I wanna start by sharing this verse with you. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse one. We've shared it before, but I'm gonna say it again. It says this in the New International Version, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. And the first question that I want to ask to you today is, do you desire spiritual gifts? I mean, is this something that you can answer with a definitive and emphatic yes, I desire spiritual gifts? And then the second question is, do you desire to prophesy? Because this really is one of the major keys to unlock the prophetic gift and that anointing over your life is that you have to desire it. This isn't something that's cheap. It doesn't come automatically. We have to have a passion to prophesy. And this passion is coupled with what Paul says right here. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. Especially. This is something that he gives distinction to. One time I had a guy ask me after I did a class like this, he said, do you think that prophecy is the greatest gift that God gives. And I read this verse, especially prophecy. This is something that Paul brought distinction to. It doesn't necessarily answer a yes to this man's question, but what I said was the greatest gift that God gives, at least in our context, is the gift that is needed in the moment that we're in. And what's important is, is that prophecy is a gift that is always helpful, always useful, always beneficial. And I have seen one word from God literally lift someone out of oppression, depression. I've seen it release purpose, destiny, and passion in someone's life. I've seen a, a prophecy drive out the lies of the devil. And so, of course, we want to be passionate to prophesy, not so that we look spiritual, not so that we look gifted, but because of what prophecy does. And so this is why we would be hungry. This is why we would have a hunger to prophesy is because of the benefit that it brings to the people that we minister to. And so right on the onset of what it takes to grow in the prophetic, it takes a hunger. It takes a thirst. It takes a desire, earnestly desire, especially prophecy. So we want to understand the reason Paul would say especially prophecy is because of the benefit that it brings, but it takes passion and desire. And so we want to ask God to give us that. We've already talked about it, but it's something we have to cultivate, something we want to focus on and continue to ask 
the question because desire in and of itself is not enough. There is some things that we need to do in order to follow through. And so I want to look a little bit first at the process of growing in the prophetic because it's important to know where you're at and what it's going to take from where you're at in order to take the next step. And I look at it like this. Prophecy or growing in the prophetic has what I think about five levels to it or five stages, my terminology. And the first stage is introduction. And what I'm talking about when I say introduction is that somehow you and I are introduced to the prophetic gift or the prophetic ministry. This means that we're talking to somebody about it, we go to a church and we see prophetic ministry, or somehow we we read a book or we were reading scriptures and we were interested, but at some point we intersected with whatever this gift is, the gift of prophecy. And so introduction happens. And this introduction is obviously something that everybody needs in order to take the next step, which is information. And this is where we decide and we choose to learn about the gift of prophecy and what it is to prophesy. So we're, of course, going to start with Scripture, but then we're going to read books. We're going to listen to tapes. We're going to take a class called the Prophetic Ministry through Immersion Discipleship School. Amen. And this might be your stage, like you are literally in the middle of getting information. I want to learn more. I hear what Paul says, that earnestly desire, especially prophecy. I hear that. I've never desired this, or maybe I have, but I don't understand it. So I need more information. So you're introduced, then you get information, but that obviously leads us to the next logical conclusion, which is demonstration. So I don't just want to hear about it. I don't just want to read about it. I want to see it. In fact, I don't think we desire things that we don't see. One of the ways that you desire to prophesy is that you see someone prophesying. It's it's the reason that advertisements are so important. You know, I like certain restaurants, and when I see an advertisement on the television, I know, because I've done the research, that advertisement companies will spend seven to ten million dollars to air basically a picture or a video of a steak and potatoes for X amount of price on a major news channel or a major uh, television station. And they're not dumb. They know what they're doing. They believe that if they can spend all of this money to put this in front of you, that at some point, maybe not now, but at some point, you will desire to go to that restaurant and eat something like what they're putting in front of you. See, we don't desire what we don't see. That's why people advertise visually. That's why you see signs on the side of the road. That's why we're big into signs, because if you can see it, you can desire it. And I think one of the reasons that we don't desire to prophesy is because we don't see it. And if the church would release that, this gift, people would be hungry to bring about that gift in their home and in their life and in their workplace and everywhere they go. And so the church needs to become a place of demonstration. And when you see the prophetic gift, this starts to build a hunger inside you. It starts to really just build this um, curiosity, right? And uh, curiosity isn't all that we need, but it helps. Like, I'm curious about this. Is this, how did you hear God? How did you know that? How did you say that? I mean, it's amazing what demonstration will do that information can't. Information will talk about a thing, but demonstration will show it. It's kind of like the show and tell. And so the telling is important, but the showing is also very, very important. And so if you're a part of a church where you see prophecy, it helps you desire it helps you to have a hunger for it. If you're not, maybe you can go to a conference, you can take this class. Obviously, this is more of the informational aspect, so you may not see it, but you can come to our conference, Ignite Conference. We have it every year, and we do a lot of prophetic ministry. In fact, we have one session where that's just all we do is prophetic ministry, healing, deliverance, and all of that. And we see God do many, many massive, incredible things because of the prophetic word that releases what God is doing. And so demonstration is stage three, but this obviously leads us to stage four. If we're going to grow in the prophetic, we've got to move from getting information and even seeing it demonstrated from someone else. We've got to move to application. So personally, we have to pursue the prophetic and we need to prophesy. And this is so important that there are some things you cannot learn by listening, by seeing, but you have to learn by doing right? And you get to that point where it's a must for you to step out and do what this, what this is all about. You have to prophesy. People ask me all the time, they say, how do you grow in the prophetic or how do you learn to prophesy? I say, well, first you want to learn everything you can about it, but you get to a point where if you don't apply what you learn, you can't learn anymore. 
You can go back and read more books. You can be a scholar on this in terms of information, but there are certain nuances. There are certain realities. There are certain, I don't know if skill is the right word, but there are certain things you cannot learn without the application of the information. And so this is very, very important. One of the things that I would encourage you to do if you're in this stage where Ben, I understand it, I know, I've seen all of that, I need to prophesy, I need to step out and give words. Here's what I would encourage you to do, very, very simple thing. When you spend time in the secret place with God and you're just in a place of prayer, get a journal and write down names of people in your life, maybe people at your job, people at your church, it could be pastors, leaders, and it could just be anybody that you met that week, doesn't matter, write down their names, Spend three, four, five minutes praying over their name. Ask God to speak to your heart. Ask God for scriptures for them. Ask God for promises. Ask God on their behalf, intercede for them, and then write down anything that you get. If you're not gonna see them, then send them a text, send them an email, and watch how they're gonna respond to what you share with them. You just say, hey, this is what I felt was on my heart as I prayed for you today. Weigh it before the Lord, pray about it, and watch what they'll do. I do this all the time, and I get people to respond back to me, and they go, man, you don't know the timing of that. If it was yesterday, it wouldn't have made sense, but the fact that it was today, the fact that you said this just as I was thinking about it, or just as I'm in the middle of something, the timing is even incredible. And so this is what I would say is God is at work in every one of us. And as we stop and we begin to seek God and apply what we've learned about the prophetic and we step into asking God for prophetic words, we can release those words over the internet, over text messaging, on a phone call, and also in person, every way. I wanna take advantage of every possible opportunity so that I prophesy every day. That's my goal is to prophesy every day. And that leads me to the fifth and final stage, which I call integration. And this is where, like I said, I wanna make a standard in my life where I prophesy over someone every day, not to earn something from you or God per se, but rather to just exercise the gift you know, part of, you know, being able to lift more weights is that you exercise regularly. You can never increase until you maximize what you have. You know, you need to know your strength. You go to the limit of your strength and then you push harder in order to lift more. And this is what the prophetic is like, is that you've got to go right to the border or the threshold of what it is that you're personally carrying right now through your understanding, um, the wisdom that you have and all of that and the anointing that you have, and you wanna push those limits and move beyond and ask God for more and increase, but you can't do that until you learn to integrate. And the illustration that I use is sort of like this, is that we start out, when we learn about the prophetic, it's kind of like those phones that we used to have that basically have a cord that you plug into the wall. You know, they're not cordless, but they're corded phones. And I remember growing up, we would have a cord, we, we would go to Radio Shack and we would buy a cord that has like a little extension plug and you could buy a really, really long cord. If you wanted to talk to that special someone, you could get it all the way into your bedroom and you would have that cord, it would be able to go all, the, all around the house. But regardless of how long your cord was, it still stayed in the home. And that's like, when you first start prophesying, that's what it's like. It's like, you can prophesy in the church, in the home, in the house. It's like that phone that has a cord, you know, no matter, uh, no matter where you go, it's still gonna be in the church. But then we wanna graduate to the cordless phone. And remember the cordless phones, they came out with the 900 megahertz and then they went to the 2.8 gigahertz and the 5.8. I mean, cordless phones, you could first use them in roaming in your home, then you could use them outside and they finally got to a place of like 5.8 gigahertz where you could be like down the street. And that really is like prophetic. We wanna grow to moving beyond just being able to prophesy at church. That becomes environmental, it becomes comfortable. But this gift is not just relegated to the four walls of a building. God has put this inside of us, and so we want to release it, not environmentally, but be able to do so outside of the church property. And this could be like maybe the cordless phone illustration, could be like the small group or another gathering or our house or whatever, but not just the church gathering. It's just more places. It replicates itself in other environments. But what we really want is the integration, which is to go cellular. You know, it's like when people had those Bluetooths where they'd stick them in their ear and they'd be walking around. Sometimes you'd think someone was talking to you. I can remember responding to people because I couldn't see that Bluetooth thing that was in their ear. But this is where you, wherever you go, 
you have the ability to hear from God and speak what he is saying to people, to go cellular, integration, right? Bluetooth, it's implanted in your ear. God is speaking to us. He wants to prophesy through us. This is the goal of what we truly want. Now listen to this in Romans chapter 12, verse five through six. This is what the apostle Paul said to the Roman church. He said, so we who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each one is to exercise them accordingly. If it's prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. Now, Paul introduces a concept there. He's talking about motivational gifts, but even though you may not have the gift of prophecy, this would apply when you go to prophesy according to the manifestation gift. He introduces a concept that the proportion or the measure of our faith um, actually matters when we go to prophesy. So some people have more or a, a greater measure of faith when they go to prophesy. They're stretching into more. And that matters because you need to know the measure of your faith. Just like I talked about when you go to the gym, you need to know the measure of your strength and you're going to max it out. But you can't grow into more until you max out what you have. And that's what it is to lift weights and increase. But in the spirit, it's the same, that you have to know the measure of your faith, but you can grow in your faith. You can grow in more, but you have to maximize first what you have. And so whatever measure of faith that you have, maybe it's just to journal out names and to start texting people. Maybe it's to you know prophesy in a prayer team or something like that at church. Maybe it's to then move from that. You keep increasing, you move beyond that, and you get to the grocery store, you get to the coffee shop, you get to um, you know, some kind of family reunion or whatever, and it just begins to go cellular. And so increasing the prophetic gift also, and, and learning to integrate it, also comes from an increase of faith where we believe God for more. And part of that, if you think about it, I believe my faith says that I can prophesy anywhere at any time. I can't tell God what to tell me. I can't make stuff up. But my faith is that whenever I look toward intentionally what God is saying for someone, just even pay attention, that the Holy Spirit is right there showing me something. Now think about this. God is omniscient. This is an incommunicable attribute of God, which means that He knows the past, present, and future of every person and everything on the planet because He's the creator of all things from the beginning to the end, the Alpha and the Omega, he has perfect knowledge about everything, which means at the same time, right now, God knows every person that's in this class. There's 155, 160 of us, plus more that are watching and listening. He knows everything about every person that's involved in this class, and he has a word for every one of us, and he knows all of that at the same time. All right, this is just blow your mind kind of stuff. Omniscience is incredible, but... It's no big deal for God to whisper into our ear a piece of information, whether it be past, present, or future, for the person that's in front of us. And our faith, or where we want to grow our faith to, is that place where we know that about our God. We know that the Holy Spirit lives in us, and we know that He has something to say to encourage and strengthen and comfort the person in front of us, no matter where we are. There's no walls that can contain the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is uncontainable. And so that's what integration actually calls out of us. It calls out of us a greater measure to go farther, to reach higher, and to move beyond wherever we're at right now. It's ever-increasing faith in the gift of prophecy. So this is the important stages. Wherever you're at on these stages, you just want to recognize the next step, and that's the purpose of even bringing that up, them up. A couple other things I want to mention, the second sort of category I want to look at is environments for growth. I think it's important if you want to grow in the prophetic that you need to know the environment that you're a part of. It really matters because truthfully, there are good environments for growth and there are bad environments for growth. And the analogy I would give to you is I live in Washington, Seattle, Washington, and oranges cannot grow in my backyard. Our climate is not conducive for this kind of fruit to grow. Oranges just simply can't. Now, I was in Orlando a few months ago, and I can tell you this, oranges can grow in Florida. The climate's right, the atmosphere's right, the temperature's right, everything is right. That environment is conducive for this kind of fruit to grow. Now, this analogy, using it for the prophetic, there are some environments that are not conducive for the prophetic to grow. They shut it down, they dismiss it, they put it down, they make fun of it, all of that. 
that's not an environment where if you're seeking to grow in the prophetic, that's going to really help you. And so what really has to happen is you have to take a class like this, you have to read a book, something that probably wouldn't be recommended by that environment, or you have to actually step out and be a part of another environment in order to be discipled and grow into the prophetic gift. A lot of environments aren't even open to be, for someone to share a prophetic gift, let alone grow in understanding it. And so really you just want to know, you need to know, that we have to foster environments, but we also have to interconnect with environments that are helping us to grow in what God has put in our life. And then from that place, we can integrate into our own life, kind of have our own weather station, so to speak. And everywhere we go, we foster an environment. It's really more of a mentality that we can prophesy according to the Spirit. And so I want to look quickly at good environments for growth, because what we see in the Old Testament is they had like schools of prophets. And this is important because we don't entirely know what went on in the schools of the prophets. The school of the prophet was just a company of people or a company of the prophets. But we know the successive line of prophets started with Samuel. Prior to Samuel, a couple of the patriarchs were actually called prophets, and this was because they were spokesmen for God, but not in the way in which the successive line of prophets began with Samuel. And we see that from Samuel, many, many, many in the lineage of prophets, so to speak, we see that there were schools, there were actual cities where there were schools of prophets, there were seers and there were prophets, there were watchmen. And we see this, these were environments that not only they would learn, the prophets would learn how to prophesy and the aspects of prophecy. We're not really invited into that scripturally of what they learned, but we know that people would even say this in the Old Testament, let's go to the prophet, let's go to the seer. See, the fact that it was established in Israel that the king had prophets, the king had seers. You remember Nathan was a prophet to, to David, King David, and Nathan had hard words for David. But the king had seers and prophets, such a reality. Think about it if your president, our president, had prophets and seers or embraced that to the point where they were part of their administration. I mean, that would be incredible. Not just an advisor, but actually part of the cohort and the administration of that particular president or world leader. And this is something that we see provided a good environment. And we see that new to, in the New Testament, there's a similar suggestion. It says that Agabus came down with many of the prophets and he gave a word to Paul and he gave a word, word to Paul's companions. We see this in two places in the book of Acts. So there's an accepted reality of prophets, prophetic gift and prophesying. Number one, we also see Paul wrote to Corinth and because he did, he was telling them, you lack no spiritual gift, but he helped them to realign the gift based on what was healthy and how that would function to benefit people most in the church. And so the fact that Corinth had this place and they were a hub of spiritual gifts, prophecy was the norm. A whole chapter on prophecy and some on tongues, chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, is devoted to this environment. Now, maybe it wasn't healthy, but it certainly was an environment where it could grow and it wasn't snuffed out. So this is important that we recognize uh, that we recognize this very thing. In some places, back in the Old Testament, in Samuel's day, 1 Samuel 19, 20, it says this, and I just want to bring it up because I think it's an important point. This is what it says, Then Saul sent messengers to take David, but when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Isn't it interesting that the anointing of the Holy Spirit was so strong when Saul sent messengers to David and David was around the company of prophets, those messengers came into that environment, they came into that anointing, and they literally started prophesying. There's another passage in the Old Testament where Saul goes out, encounters the company of the prophets. It says he falls on the ground and he's prophesying for hours. It, it has other instances where somebody would bring out like a harp or a musical instrument, and that would set the environment, it would set the tone in order to prophesy. And so we see this environmental aspect where there's openness and embracing and it's set as the reality that causes the gift to emerge, to grow and to be fruitful. And we want to cultivate that also in our times, because I feel like what happens is, is that we're so devoted to theology. We're so devoted to intellect. We're so devoted to an intellectual way about running church and doing church that we don't allow the power of God to be released. We actually, in fact, hold it back. The rivers of living water that Jesus spoke about in John 7, 37 are not released because we often don't cultivate the kind of environment that's conducive for the fruit that we're talking about, namely prophecy. 
And so we see this. We can look at some bad environments for growth because we just sort of want to identify them. Uh, but when you don't believe in the prophetic, number one, or you think it's a gift that no longer is for today, people that don't want the prophetic, people that experienced abuse. And we see this actually in Scripture, 1 Thessalonians. We get our rapture theology, whether you believe in that or not, we get that typically from 1 Thessalonians. And so what we know about the context of 1 Thessalonians is that there were so-called prophets that were traveling through Thessalonica and they were telling the people in that church that Jesus had already returned. And Paul writes them two letters, but in the first letter he tells them Jesus has not returned and he's not going to come to those that know him like a thief in the night. It will be like the day dawning, you know, as you rise, you'll understand that Jesus is not going to sneak upon you. You're expecting, you're awaiting his return. And so he's comforting them. But something that he says, first he talks about tongues a little bit in 1 Thessalonians 5, but he says something very interesting to a people who had experienced false prophecy and potentially false prophets who told them things that were not true. He was telling them, encouraging them not to despise prophesying which means that they probably didn't want to have anything to do with it. It was easier for them to just say, anybody that claims to be a prophet and any prophecy that comes forth, we shut it down, we don't buy into it, we don't believe in it, we're not interested in it. A lot of churches today do that very thing. They develop theology around that fact. It's a fact to them at least. But this is what Paul said, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21. He says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. Look what he says. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. This like word picture would be similar to like if you had a hose and when you're like washing your car and you quench or you clench the hose. And so the flow of the water can't actually keep flowing because you, you've actually quenched that hose. He's saying don't quench the flow of the Spirit. And the flow of the Spirit is defined by prophetic utterances. That's one of the elements that he's saying that they've quenched. So don't do this. Don't despise. Don't look down on. Don't dismiss. Don't deny prophetic utterances. But he says, examine everything carefully in order to hold fast to that which is good. A modern equivalent would be eat the meat, spit out the bones, but you still need the meat. And this is what he's talking about. Examine it carefully. Discern it. Don't just embrace it like you once did, which caused you to be bitter because you believe these prophets. You didn't pray about it. You didn't discern it. You didn't seek to know if it was actually from the Lord. You just got discouraged. You got bitter. You found out it was false. And then you said, I want to have anything to do with it. Examine it carefully and hold fast to the good parts. Be able to discern this. Be able to weigh this. And this is a bad environment for growth would be Thessalonica in their times because they had experienced abuse. And Paul had to write to them to move them out of that place that they were stuck in because there is false prophets there are it is there is false prophecy but we need to know the difference between a false prophet and false prophecy you can give a word and miss it and it doesn't make you a false prophet accuracy is only one marker to determine whether or not it's a prophetic word or it's a real prophet and that's not the only marker to discern, right? So we'll talk about that in just a moment. But suffice it to say, there are good environments for growth in the prophetic and there are bad ones. And you need to know what you're a part of right now. You need to know, do you have the kind of environment that will help you to excel and help you to develop this precious gift, this precious anointing that we all as the body of Christ can carry. And some of us, it is our actual gifting. And so this is important to note. The next thing I want to talk to you about briefly is there are different stages of growing in the prophetic. I wish that you just woke up and you were automatically mature, but you're not. And so I just talk about um, really the three stages, but I want to identify something in that. And the first is the beginner. And these are people that are just starting out. You know, when you start out, you're going to misinterpret visions that you see. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to say words. You're going to, you know, try to teach while you prophesy. We'll talk a little bit about that next session. But there are a lot of mistakes that you make. And sometimes people have this idea that if you're just a messenger and he gives the message, then you just deliver the message. Well, I wish it were like that. But the Old Testament prophets, they were held to the standard of fullness of accuracy. That doesn't mean we don't want to be accurate. It just means that we don't hear as clearly because we're not writing scripture. And so we are working together to discern the voice of the Lord as the voice of the Lord comes to us many different ways. And we're doing so with the responsibility and the level of faith that we have. And that means that we're going to grow. 
All of the gifts of the Spirit require faith in order to activate them, but they also require this trajectory of growth, this tolerance for growth. I don't want to miss it, but you have to understand that you start out in a certain place. If we want to hold everybody to the Jesus level standard of prophecy, we have to do the same thing for teaching. And that means that the first time that you teach, you had better be prepared to also teach as good as Jesus with authority. This is so vital. And a lot of people will actually talk about having the gift of prophecy at full 100% Isaiah Jesus level, but they won't have that same standard for teaching. Why? because we try to define or distinguish the difference between something supernatural and something natural. Well, the problem with that is, is that the gift of teaching is also spiritual. It's not just natural. It may come off natural, but it's a communicative gift, just like prophecy. And they all come from the Holy Spirit. So to suggest that it's just natural versus supernatural, and that's why there's a higher standard of the supernatural, it's just something that doesn't work. In fact, I think it's one of the reasons why there are so many bad environments of growth for the prophetic is because people have no tolerance and no trajectory of growth built into that in order to experience that higher fruitfulness. If we want to grow the prophetic gift and mantle to the highest biblical proportion that we read about in Scripture, we have to also understand that it's going to take a level of growth. We're going to have to grow into that. We can't just ask for it and expect it automatically. And if we're not patient and willing to walk out that process, we will never see it. To move beginners to mature, that takes time. That just simply takes time. And we're making the assumption that the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs and the Ezekiels and all of these in the Old Testament had no process, that they were a messenger receiving a message. They had no process whatsoever. And I just don't believe that. I don't think that's the way it works. I don't think in the New Testament, like Agabus was somebody who basically never had any growth spurts or anything to learn, or maybe he missed it a little bit, or maybe he didn't say something the way that he could have or should have. God speaks all of our languages, first of all, and secondly, he trusts us to communicate those words with our own words. And so he could use more effective servants and ways and means to get these messages across. But somehow the Lord is trusting us even as we stumble and fumble and make mistakes. And he's working with us to refine what it is that we're seeking to do to bring him glory. And so it's important that we do that. No, we're not writing scripture. And so that's where we want to distinguish even what the Old Testament prophets were accountable for. We only have so many prophecies that are even recorded in the Old Testament, and we don't know how many of those there actually were. But anyways, we have the beginner, and we want to understand that's where everybody starts out, and there's a lot of, we have a trajectory of growth though. But then there's also the immature, and there are immature prophets and prophetic gifts and that really is where people prophesy of the flesh. It's not demonic, but it's not of the Lord. And they're prophesying vain imaginations, things that they want. You know, I mean, when I look at, think of immature, whether it's gifting or just Christians, I look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 through 3, and this is what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church, who he also addressed on the prophetic gift later on. He says this, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy, strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? One of the questions that I had after reading this was, how old were the Corinthian believers that Paul would expect them to be higher than they were? And most scholars would say somewhere between six to eight years old in the Lord. So they obviously had only been in Christ for so long, and Paul's expectation of where they could be or should be is far beyond where they are right now. And what's interesting about that is that he's saying that you guys are still fleshly, you're still acting like mere men, you're still immature, and it really is because of the way that you're walking out your life in Christ. It's not because you are you aren't where you you are where you're supposed to be like just like we grow in the natural when you're three you're four you're five you know a five-year-old always wants to be a 16 year old but you should just be a five-year-old he's not saying that like you know i can't wait till you're older and he's really exasperated because they're not older than they are he's saying that you're not living up to the potential of where you should be and that's making them fleshly. That's making them immature. Well, imagine if you're a prophetic person or you have a prophetic gift and you're prophesying out of your strife, out of your jealousy, out of your anger. And this is very true. This happens all the time where people will exercise their gift 
um, but they're just off because they're coming from a wrong motivation or they're coming from a wrong heart or they're misunderstanding the purpose of the point or even what they're seeing and, and hearing. And this happens all the time. And so I'm not saying we should have a tolerance for that. That's why we need to discern what is God and what is not. It's so important. But we want to look at also um, the false. There are false prophets. And a false prophet is an unregenerate person, a person that is not a believer. A false prophet is not someone who is a believer who makes a mistake when they prophesy. That is not a false prophet. Deuteronomy 18 is something that people will recite or quote as sort of like a, a litmus test for whether or not a person's a real prophet or not. But when you read that, it's a messianic prophecy about, you know, a, Jesus to come because Moses is saying that God told him, I will raise up a prophet from among you like you. Well, who's like Moses? That's going to be Jesus, right? Jesus is going to, well, Moses was the bringer, bring, he was the bringer, uh, the one that brought forth the Israel's religion, if you want to call it that, but the law and all of that commandments that God brought. And so Jesus comes and he brings obviously grace and truth. And so right after this kind of archetype or type was Moses. And so he's saying, I will raise up from among your people someone like you. This is Jesus he's talking about. But then he talks about if a prophet comes among you and he basically speaks dreams and visions or whatever, and they do not come to pass, don't listen to him. And that's because he's leading people astray. The, the markers for a true prophet is first, uh, who is, what God is he speaking for and what God is he leading people towards? And then secondly, is it accurate? And that determines whether or not the prophecy is true. You can have a real prophet speak a wrong word and you can have a false prophet speak a word of the past. And that isn't a real prophecy of that which is to come, right? That would be prognostication because they're guessing, right? Only the, the Lord or the Holy Spirit knows the future. The enemy does not know the future. And through a demonic network, they potentially know the past depending on how the spirits are working in that family or around those people. They only know past, they can only guess the future. The enemy does not know the future. And so that's why psychics and all these kind of people, these are false prophets. This is what would be in the Old Testament. When the prophets in the Old Testament would say, thus saith the Lord, they said that because they were speaking for Yahweh. Capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament was Yahweh. It's thus saith, saith the Lord. This is what Yahweh is saying. Other prophets from other gods, this is what Baal is saying. This is what Ashtoreth is saying. This is what Asherah is saying. They, they would identify the God that they were speaking for. And this was so important because when you spoke as a prophet, you had to identify what God this was coming from. So this is what you read about in the Old Testament. False prophets would speak in the name of another God. But in the New Testament, false prophets will try to come under the guise of being a Christ follower. And so we want to discern the content of their message, the character of their life, and all of that. So it's a little bit more difficult in the sense that they're not just worshipers of Baal directly or in an outward way where we, we could all see that. And so we want to know there are false prophets, there's false prophecy. But the fourth thing I wanted to say was is that we move from the beginner, we want to move out of immaturity, and we want to move into maturity. And this is where we, we grow as like Samuel did as a prophet, where it says about Samuel in 1 Samuel 3, 19 through 20, it says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. It took time in order to bring about credibility for Samuel. His words had to be tested. He was attested. It took a period of time to show that his words did not fall to the ground, but they hit the mark. And then over time, people actually attested to his words and said that this man is a true prophet. And it takes time for people to come into maturity. Nobody shows up, gives one accurate prophetic word and should be recognized as a true prophet. Again, accuracy cannot be the only marker. And so this is why we recognize that there are literally stages of growing in the prophetic. There's the beginner, and there's the people that can be immature, and there's also false. That's not really a stage. That's just more of like a reality in all of this that we want to discern. But our goal is to get to the mature. And my estimation, a person that identifies their prophetic gift or begins to prophesy, or they're called to be a prophet either way, is that it takes the minimum 10 years usually to get to a place where there's real maturity flowing out of them. A lot of people, it takes longer. Now, there's no real number that we can read in Scripture, so some could be shorter, but we just need to understand that this takes time. 
for credibility to be established and wor the word of a prophet or that gift and anointing on someone can be trusted. And anybody, even though they've become mature, can be led astray. So all things, all things, no matter who they are, need to be discerned. And the word of God is what we truly tether our lives to. Prophets and prophecy have its place and its purpose, but they do not have the same purpose as the Word of God. And I just want to remind you of that. Now, the final thing that we want to look at real quickly is the pattern for growing in the prophetic. And a lot of this is just a reminder of things that I've already said. And so I'm just going to bring up as we begin to prophesy, which is what our next session is all about, we want to look at it like this. Here is basically the grid or the outline for ministering prophetically. Number one, we, we have revelation. This is where we see, we hear, and we sense what God is saying to us. And we've gone over that really well. That's the aspect of receiving the prophetic in order to give. We have revelation. The second uh, pattern is that we interpret. Some is symbolic, right? We've talked about that in detail when we looked at visions. You know, much of the Bible is metaphoric, and so it requires interpretation. A lot of what God says to us requires interpretation. So we become translators. We receive, we're tuned into the frequency of God's language, and then we translate to the people that are in front of us. And we need to know who's in front of us and become like a prophetic linguist is what I'm writing about in my book, basically. You want to become a prophetic linguist and know who you're talking to, the message that you're receiving, be able to translate that message to who's in front of you. And it requires interpretation some of the time, right? So the symbolic nature of what God might say to us, we need to be able to filter that in a way where it makes clear sense. And I'm just wanting to say this, clarity matters. People want to know what God is saying, and we don't want to make it obscure, weird, strange. We want to demystify the prophetic in order for people to receive the clearest benefit. And you're the same way as I am. The clearer something is, the more accountable and the more responsible. Um, I, I just think even the more we can step into it, and more quickly even, but the more obscure, the more ambiguous, um, we don't want that to be on us. If God gives us an ambiguous word, fine, but we don't want to make it more obscure, more strange, more weird, because we just have learned in a subculture of Christianity how to have our own lingo. We just want to move away from the Christianese and speak to people their language with what God gives to us. So we have revelation, interpretation, and then what I'm calling administration. This is where we receive, we understand, and we step out. We administer. We start to prophesy. Again, our next session is all about that, but this is what we want to do, be as clear as possible. And number four is application. And the reason I bring this up is because the word in and of itself may not carry with it an application. In other words, here's the word and here's what you need to do. That person needs to seek the Lord. So I encourage all of our people or anybody that I've trained in the prophetic that you need to make sure that you're not trying to attach your own thoughts, your own teaching, project your own experiences onto that word because they may not apply and it may take away from the word. So we need, we've got to get really good at sharing the word and separating that from any advice that we might give. See, what's important is that when, in scripture, when you read about somebody receiving a word, they didn't know necessarily how to apply that word and it caused them uh, to move into a pursuit. I think sometimes that God gives us a word that's well ahead of our time that draws us into a pursuit. And I think sometimes when we're prophesying to a person, we want to quickly give them this like application point. We're really good at that. Our sermons are like one, two, three. Here's the step of getting close to God. Here's the five easy steps of making your life all better. And that's just not the way that life works in the spirit. The way that life works in the spirit is there are cycles and God invites us into pursuit. And there are things that you can't have, you can't learn, you won't obtain unless you move into that cycle and you begin to pursue the Lord and hear from him personally. So I'm, I'm presenting this as a caution to not give your stories, your anecdotes, your illustrations, and your experiences necessarily when you prophesy, because that again can muddy the waters and a person can walk out of the doors and not even remember what the actual prophetic word was. So be careful about that because there's a passage that sort of came to my heart that I want to share with you that helps us understand this a little better. And this is where King David was called as a king. He was anointed as a king in 1 Samuel 16, 12. Um, this is what it says when Samuel came to anoint him. So he sent and brought him in. This is where they brought in David because none of his brothers actually were the king. And Samuel mentions this. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. 
And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for he, this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now what's interesting is that David was anointed king, but then his father, not long after that experience, just kicks him outside and goes, go, says to him, go back up on that hillside and take care of my sheep. <laughs> so he's anointed king of Israel, but none of that's in reality. That's a future thing that's going to happen. He doesn't know how, he doesn't know when. And we need to realize this, that God is giving us words, prophetic words for people, and we have no way to help them apply that word. We have to just lead people to the Lord. We're facilitating an encounter with God, a moment with God, and we need to be clear that we may not know how to apply this word, so we've gotta be careful. Let the Lord, right? Let the Lord be the one to lead people. He's going to, but don't get in the way. Don't get in the way. Be careful when you share application. So we have revelation, interpretation, administration. Those are the three things that we do as we receive, interpret, understand, and, and then minister prophetically. But after that, the application we need to have a strong caution on. All that said, as we close our session, I want to pray once again that we have a hunger to prophesy. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Well, sorry, he says, follow the way of love earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you prophesy. We need a hunger to prophesy because we know the benefit that it brings people in our world. So let me pray that over us as we close our session today. Father, I thank you for everyone taking this class, and I pray for an impartation of hunger to prophesy, not for us to be spiritual, not for us to look important, not for anybody to notice us, but for people to really see you, for people to experience you, for people to hear from you. We pray, God, for maximum benefit. Help us to grow in the prophetic by first giving us a hunger to take the necessary steps that we need to take. I pray you bless and strengthen all of my friends who are taking this class, watching this online. We love you and we look forward to what you're going to do in and through us as we grow in the prophetic gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. I look forward to our next session together. Yeah.